This next book has a somewhat provocative and maybe scandalous title, but I promise the content is uh, not going to turn too many heads. Um, the book is Immodest Acts, The Life of a Lesbian Nun in Renaissance Italy by Judith C. Brown. Um, just so you don't get too interested in the topic right away, uh, the amount of lesbianism in the book that is overt is vanishingly small, so uh, don't get too excited about that. Um, Judith C. Brown in this book is much more interested in the sociological and psychological ways that uh, religion functioned in early 17th century early 17th century Italy and how people use shifting ideas of gender and shifting ideas for of gender for various reasons and to perhaps um, create various alibis and I'll go into that in a bit um, so what is the book about exactly in the year 1600 at the tender age of nine Benedetta Carlini was sent to a nunnery in the small town of Pescia in northern central Italy and what today might be considered cruel and highly unusual punishment for a young girl was then a way for Benedetta's somewhat well-to-do parents to provide their daughter with protection. After several years of, at the nunnery, which Brown describes as fairly unremarkable, uh, Benedetta began to have a series of increasingly disturbing visions, including being sexually harassed by demons. Uh, S Sister Benedetta was eventually assigned a companion named Bartolomeo Crivelli, uh, who was also a sister in the convent, whose presence, as the subtitle hints, would later become problematic for her. Bartolomeo's job was to assist Benedetta through her, quote, periods of ecstasy, and was present when she supposedly received the stigmata from Christ and also exchanged mystical hearts with Christ. Uh, by the way, uh, receive or excuse me, exchange mystical hearts is not um, a euphemism. It's actually quite literal. Um, Brown describes what uh, Benedetta herself thought she experienced. She thought she had actually had Christ stick his hand into her chest and take out her still beating heart. So, that's that's not nice allegorical or metaphorical language. She actually thought that Jesus took her heart. Uh, naturally, this caught the attention of some of the more conservative counter-reformation forces in the Catholic Church, whose main goal was uh, maintaining a sense of propriety. Uh, two separate men, uh, and they would be men, naturally, uh, were sent out to Pescia to investigate what was happening. Stefano Cecchi was the first to investigate Benedetta over a number of visits throughout late 1619. Cecchi's main purpose was to ensure that Benedetta was remaining within theological accepted boundaries, and uh, which she was actually very conscious of doing, uh, knowing that moving beyond those would have put her reputation and more importantly her life in danger. A Chechi, who was eventually satisfied that Benedetta was not a heretic, left quietly to resume his position as the provost of Pescia. At least for a while, things appeared to return to normal in the convent. A few years later, though, uh, sometime between the time of August 1622 and March 1623, uh, the papal nuncio sent several representatives, led by a man named Alfonso uh, Gigioli, Gigioli uh, to examine Benedetta's claims a second time. In 1620, she had become an abbess uh, of her convent at the incredibly young age of 30. And that is incredibly young. You have to imagine she's looking 
over women and in charge of women who are sometimes twice and even three times her age if she's 30 years old. Um, Benedetta had recently been uh, deeply moved by the death of her father in 1620. The nuncio's representatives proceed in much the same way as the earlier set of visits. Uh, their final ruling on Benedetta's case isn't given until the beginning of the epilogue. And this is what Brown has to say about that. The story of Benedetta Carlini is shrouded in mystery for the next 40 years. No records exist of the nuncio's pronouncements, and it's only the chance survival of one fragment of one nun's diary that allows us to know the outcome. On August 7th, 1661, that nun, whose name has not come down to us, wrote in her diary this. Benedetta Carlini died at age 71 of fever and colic pains after 18 days of illness. She died in penitence, having spent 35 years in prison. So, obviously, um, the second, I guess, trial, uh, to, to use a particularly formal word, um, wasn't nearly uh, so lenient with her as the first one was. At this point, you might be wondering, um, what about the lesbianism? Where, where's the lesbianism? Like I said, its relevance and Brown's discussion of it are extremely uh, fleeting. Uh, Bartolomea gives uh, testimony uh, that Benedetta sexually molested her and engaged in fraudage with her while possessed by the spirit of a male demon known as Splendatello. Uh, while Benedetta and Bartolomeo's sexual uh, behavior merits perhaps a few sentences in the book uh, and in the introduction and pepper throughout the text, Brown discusses how Benedetta and Splendatello's maleness, how she used Splendatello's maleness as a foil to explain away her rape of Bartolomeo. And according to Bartolomeo's testimony, that it, it, it really was rape. Uh, the book remains ambiguous as to whether Benedetto, Benedetta actually and deliberately used her male demon as an excuse or whether she actually thought it possessed her. But the Nuncio's representatives seem unconvinced as they accused her of pretending to be a mystic and of being a woman of ill repute. So, so you can see how the idea of gender as mask, a gender as something that's performative and that can be taken on and put off in various circumstances is an aspect of this story that would be really interesting to any historian to look at and especially how those masks and how those roles are affected and changed and, and, and made dynamic by the presence of religion and the fact that all of this is taking place in a convent 400 years ago. Like I said, the, the title is a little bit uh, sensationalistic. Um, it's much more about gender and gender roles than it is about lesbianism per se because even if Benedetta was a lesbian uh, she probably wouldn't have really known what that meant since those kinds of words are much much newer than the early 17th century even those ideas are much newer um, of course, you know, homosexual acts are not, they're, they're much, much older, but identities like gay or lesbian are, are what I'm really talking about. But anyway, if you're interested in sort of the psychological, sociological impacts of religion and gender roles and how these things can sort of become locked up with one another, uh, this is a pretty interesting book. Immodest Acts. The Life of a Lesbian Nun in Renaissance Italy by Judith C. Brown.